there is one, there was one, and there may be another one. It all started with a little game called EverQuest. Its gameplay was derivative of text-based MUDs from the early 90s, or multi-user dungeons, which are themselves derivative of Dungeons & Dragons has been around since the early 70s, is played by an estimated 5 million people. It is also the target of a group of concerned parents in the United States who call themselves BAD, B-A-D-D, -D, bothered about Dungeons & Dragons. With character archetypes such as the warrior, the wizard, and the wise-ass or some of the other advanced classes in between. You slay monsters, you get loot, and if you're lucky, you experience a decent story. There's no board or pieces. Here. It's all in the imagination. I'm gonna walk out. You're gonna walk out. A black exit out of the game. You oh, have just died, you. went into another multi-universe, no longer existing. You just got wiped out. Okay. The battle is decided by an intricate scoring system and by these special dice. I would, of course, be remiss not to mention Ultima Online, a significant 2D MMO from 1997, and there were many aspects of this game worth mentioning for this video. It was very PvP-centric, with sandbox elements never before seen in an online game, such as owning houses that actually took up space in the world. Players could attack each other at any time, and death meant your body would fall as it was, lootable by any and all players. It was truly an RPG. You were living in the world. We invite you, and several thousand of your closest friends, to live, quest, fight, love, or hate in a fully persistent world, where every action you take affects the lives of others. But this game was fully 3D, and the PC gaming public became witness to the birth of many MMO tropes, Relentless experience grinds, brutal death penalties like corpse runs and de-leveling, obscure quests with no quest helper, raiding for high-end loot, camping rare spawns for 36 hours, paging your guildies on your beeper when that rare world boss finally pops, multi-boxing, could you imagine? And much more antiquated bullshit I can't fit in this video. It was old school, but back then, it was school because you skipped school to play it. It was character permanence in a persistent and immersive online world. Jolly cooperation to take down mighty foes. Trade and commerce. Economy, uh, words, dueling for glory. And filthy sexting. I met my wife in EverQuest as well. So you guys met through EverQuest? Yeah, all, all three of us met through EverQuest. I think uh, EverQuest was a brilliant game. There were so many great aspects, not only to the game itself, but the community. Someone stops by and says, hey, how do I get to such and such place? Oh, you give them the loc, you know, you give them a location number. It's not like you just point and say, go that way. But as they leave, they're like, they'll, their character will wave or bow, and they'll say, good hunting. And you'll say the same, good hunting to you. Role playing would be taking on the persona of your character. This is an XR, it's a lizard. A lot of people who really get into the role playing, when they're typing words with an S, they'll put several S's in as if it has a lizard lisp. People will speak in like old English. It's interesting to see some of the people that really get into the role playing aspect of the game. We're not really together though, so. Uh... Do you think that if EverQuest never existed, that World of Warcraft would have come into existence when it did. No way, I mean, we were heavily influenced by it. I mean, we were also extremely influenced by Ultima Online, but it was really EverQuest that spurred us to the idea. The first impression was just completely wild, blown away, like a kid, you know, in Paris for the first time. Never having been to Europe. I gladly pay my $9.99 a month, and I get to indulge myself in something that's familiar and that I like. The game required a monthly subscription to play to keep the servers running. This was a new concept back then, but kids were more than willing to steal their parents' credit cards. It quickly became the highest selling RPG ever at the time. By early 2000, it had sold over 230,000 copies. The game would eventually peak at 550,000 active subscribers at 9.89 a month per customer. That's a lot of gold. 
EverQuest's unprecedented success and influence would alter the gaming market forever, and it established the MMORPG genre. But other studios caught on to this success, and we would see more MMOs. Just a few years after EverQuest's release, a fateful day rolls by. It's June 26th, 2003. The number one song in the UK is Bring Me to Life by Evanescence. LeBron James is selected as the first pick in the NBA draft, and the Supreme Court makes a landmark decision for LGBT rights in Lawrence v. Thomas. But most of this was lost on me because I was 12, and apparently all I cared about was the release of a video game. Star Wars Galaxies. It cannot be understated, the hype behind this game at the time. Not only was it Star Wars, which was hugely popular again thanks to The Phantom Menace and a slew of books, comics, and other video games coming out at the time, but this was an MMO made by the creators of EverQuest. Nerds were frothing at the mouth. From 91 to 93, the Thrawn trilogy is released. This series of books is largely credited for reigniting interest in the expanded universe of Star Wars. Non-film content. We'll go that way. This is the 1st of November, 1994. Today is my first day of writing the new Star Wars series. Things have advanced so far in the last 20 years in terms of your ability to portray things on the screen that were just literally impossible before and then very difficult in terms of cost. It's always a limiting factor. When these three, I do these three, then it's finished. I've, I've kind of done the, the story and I, I feel I've accomplished what I set out to do originally. And in 99, it does release. Phantom Menace and EverQuest come out the same year. Fast forward to March of 2000. LucasArts approaches the developers of EverQuest, Virant, and strikes an agreement for them to make a Star Wars online game. They announced it, stating it would be released by 2001. Yes, just one year of development expected. It would take place during the original trilogy era between New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, but they would still include prequel content, like Naboo, music from Phantom Menace, and the ability to massacre Gungans. Even though it was early on in MMO history, it would still be the first licensed MMO game of an established intellectual property. One of the biggest in the world at that. So expectations were... Galactic? Virant hired a few veterans in the MMO world, in Raf Koster and Rich Vogel, who had worked on Ultima Online. The company would set up a new office in Austin, Texas, and were ready to work on a new, legendary game. But just a couple months later, Virant Interactive was acquired by Sony Online Entertainment. The game finally begins development in September of 2000, half a year after the game was announced. About seven months into development, SOE announces that there will also be a Space Sim expansion to be released six months after the base game. They also pushed back the initial release from 2001 to the second half of 2002. Later that year, the chief creative officer of SOE resigns to form his own game company, taking many original EverQuest developers with him. This caused some disruption within the office, but they powered onward anyways. Eventually, the website reached 100,000 users, making it the biggest online community for a game at the time. Everyone was eager to learn any scraps of information they could about perceivably the most important game of their lives. Eventually, Galaxies is announced for PlayStation 2 and Xbox, but both versions would get cancelled before release. And then in July 2002, closed beta testing began. Players were introduced to the profession system. Characters didn't just pick one class, they were meant to specialize in multiple professions, each of which were focused on different personalities and roles people would play in the game's ecosystem. There were combat classes, such as marksmen and brawlers, but also entertainers, doctors, crafters, gatherers, even hairstylists. Professions were meant to reflect the Bartle taxonomy of player types. It's basically an alignment chart of how players play in multiplayer games. I think in more modern terms, you'd say something like PvP, PvE, roleplay, and solo players. 
In short, there would be a place for everybody. It was designed to be a sandbox style MMO, similar to Ultima Online, allowing players to explore planets freely, level up multiple classes of their choice, and even have a real house within the world that people could visit. In the holiday of 2002, the core game gets a subtitle, Star Wars Galaxies and Empire Divided, alluding to the heavy focus of Rebel vs. Imperial faction action gameplay. Characters could sign up between the fascist Imperials or the correct Rebel Alliance. <laughs> And then, the release date is once again pushed back, to April of 2003. And when that time finally comes around, SOE needs more time. I'm afraid he's running out of time. Why? What's wrong with him? It's his time. It's running out. Well, what does he need? He needs to have more time. What can we do? Well, I suppose we could try a time transplant. They make a case to LucasArts to delay the game once again, preferably by the holiday season, about eight more months. They were given two. At this point, everyone in SOE was living in the office, crunching, trying to get SWG ready. Many features weren't working, had to be cut or delayed until after release, such as vehicles and mounts, meaning people had to walk everywhere on launch. This actually made the Scout class really important, which had a skill tree dedicated to traversing terrain quicker. Player housing would be in the game at launch, but the player city feature was delayed. A lot of quest content that they planned out was constantly breaking, and they resorted to mission terminals as a main source of content for many professions. There was supposed to be a dynamic point of interest system intended to randomly pop up in the wilderness, generated layouts of buildings, enemies, friendly NPCs. These dynamic quests were scrapped. Professions as a whole also suffered during this crunch time. Originally, some professions were much bigger or smaller in their skill trees depending on their complexity. Maybe Image Designer would be a smaller skill tree, whereas Commando would be much bigger. But the guy in charge of professions left for another company and on short notice. So in a pinch, all professions were made to fit a new, more rigid onion skill tree system. Smaller professions had to be bloated out, and bigger classes had to be heavily condensed. And finally, some professions were just cut altogether, like writer, miner, and other untold half-baked ideas. And a cherry on top for all these issues is the hardware SOE was using to deploy their live game wasn't as powerful as their testing hardware. The biggest side effect of this was enemy AI was unable to negotiate terrain correctly to find players. They found a solution for this issue at the sacrifice of players no longer being able to step over shorter 3D objects or jumping, making you feel more like a 2D dot on the floor when it came to getting around obstacles. Yes, there was a jump emote, but it wasn't really a jump. Leading up to release, SOE even flew out some of their most dedicated community members trying to get their opinion on what needed to be fixed most, what was necessary, what was unnecessary, and what they wanted to see on release if possible. Then in June 2003, Star Wars Galaxies finally released for the US and Europe, and no one could log in. Eventually, the game recovered after stumbling out the gate, and gradually, features were finished and bugs were squashed. Star Wars Galaxies launched with eight playable races, each race had different bonuses that gave them a slight edge in some professions, while humans were evenly balanced across all attributes. Characters started in one of six basic professions, and once you meet prerequisites for some advanced classes, you could take those as well. There was a limit though, your character only had so many profession points, and you only had one character per server. You had to rely on others for essential services. Crafters for gear, entertainers for healing fatigue and wounds, doctors for healing diseases and giving buffs, smugglers for slicing open containers or illegally modifying your gear beyond their natural limits. Traveling between planets and towns would be accomplished through the use of shuttles and spaceports, which would ferry players around on a set timer, so they became many hubs of social interaction and even PvP.
don't talk to me. Don't. Each of the initial 10 planets consisted of 16 square kilometers of openly navigable area. Anywhere that wasn't a major city, you could build your house. All you need to do was acquire a blueprint crafted by an architect and place it down. Although housing was awesome and great for neighborhoods and private merchant empires, houses were getting placed around the entrances to the very few static, open-world dungeons that everyone had to share. For the combat system, it's all about ham. Health, action, and mind bars. Every combat skill targeted one or more of these pools of points. If any of these bars reach zero, you're incapacitated and prone to be death-blown. When you died in the game, your clone would be reproduced at a nearby cloning facility, incurring wounds, fatigue, and even paying a credit fee if you didn't make it your selected cloning facility. Through combat and death, you would receive many different types of wounds, disease, and fatigue, all of which needed to be healed by doctors or entertainers. These debuffs would permanently lower your ham bars and other stats, so it was important to get it resolved. I think by this point developers realized that players didn't like such punishing death penalties, like having to go run and get your corpse, or losing experience. Every time you used a skill it went into the combat queue, which went off over time on a global cooldown. There were also different postures and stances you could take, which limited movement and made you more vulnerable to melee attacks, but also allowed for better ranged accuracy. Mission terminals would generate random missions in the wilderness, usually consisting of basically you just go to a waypoint and kill some things and destroy a nest. Entertainers made their earnings in cantinas through tips. Gathering resources meant you had to go out there and survey the land. And crafters basically made everything in the game. Medkits, houses, droids, armor, weapons, clothing, instruments, spice, you name it. And if you were a merchant, then player housing was extra important because you could set up merchant NPCs in your house to sell your wares. It was really common to shop around for best-in-slot equipment at player neighborhoods, and saving the waypoint for later in your datapad. The game also featured no main storyline. It was buggy as hell, reviews were mixed at best, and there was a clear lack of content. Yet still, it was Star Wars, and players made their own fun. It became the second biggest MMO outside of Asia behind EverQuest. Sure, many players were unsubbing due to the game's bugs and balance issues, but the player base kept growing every month, eventually surpassing 300,000 subs by October 2003. This is what many nostalgically refer to as the golden age of SWG. But expectations from LucasArts were higher. They wanted to bolster the subscription numbers in a big way. They wanted a wave of new and returning players. They wanted a Jedi by Christmas. So let's talk about the Jedi problem. How do you implement a high-demand Jedi class into a game set during the original trilogy? After all, they're supposed to be, you know, dead. You just can't have a thousand Jedi walking all over the place. Not to mention, they would be totally overpowered compared to other classes. Well, as it turns out, Jedi were already in the game at launch. There were rumors of a Jedi class, but no one actually knew it existed. Keep in mind that this is before the modern day of MMOs, where every bit of information is data mined the microsecond the game is made available to the public. There was still an air of mystery to these games back then. The most we had was like... Alakazam? God, I'm old. The method to unlock Jedi had many reworks, but here's how it went down. And a lot of this is directly from Raf Koster's website, the director of SWG. At first, SOE wanted Jedi to only be unlocked by those they deemed worthy and wouldn't abuse their overpowered status. They considered picking players by hand, based on how much they played the game or how honorably they roleplayed, but then who decides who's the best roleplayer. Then they thought, maybe it could be players who completed a randomized set of hidden tasks, a checklist showing that they experienced every part of the game. It could be things like visiting the highest point on a planet, killing a rare creature, winning some duels, or crafting a specific item. And they would try to make each character's list different so players couldn't reverse engineer the process and figure it out. And that's almost how it ended up. But there was one problem. The way they tracked data across characters simply couldn't handle tracking these types of parameters. And making a new data system would be impossible in the time frame they had before launch. So they altered this idea to make it fit with the data they were already storing. Professions. 
Each character had to master four different professions, and the next time they logged in, they would be awarded the Jedi character slot, or the FS slot. The four professions each character needed to master were random, so players couldn't pinpoint how to unlock it, keeping it a mystery. Right? Well, no one figured it out. That's not to say people weren't looking, but people were so busy playing professions that they liked doing what they wanted to do. At the rate players were mastering professions, which took weeks if not months, the first Jedi was predicted to appear in about nine years. LucasArts was firm, and SOE was told, drop hints. The solution? Drop Jedi holocrons as rare loot from high-level mobs that when used, they would literally tell you one of the professions you needed to master. The earliest person to unlock their Force-sensitive character was Monica Tsarn on the Intrepid server. She unlocked her Jedi on the 8th of November 2003. Once it was out that Jedi was real and that these strange, ultra-rare holocrons mentioned professions, the Womp Rat was out of the bag. People either got a hold of the holocron and abandoned their professions to master whatever it told them to, or they circumvented the holocron and just went down the list of professions, mastering everything in hopes that they'd hit the four they need to unlock their FS slot. Jedi was not so mysterious anymore. People no longer played the role they had fun with. They started grinding out classes they never would have otherwise touched. Remember that old armor smith smuggler you love to buy your gear from? Now they're AFK grinding dancer with macros. Your master fencer buddy you used to farm mobs with and PvP? She's a moisture farmer now. It became harder to find quality crafted goods because good crafters were grinding something else and so much junk was dumped on the market by other grinders. Soon enough, overpowered Jedi started popping up more and more. The dreaded glow bats, they called them. They would dominate in PvP, further disrupting the balance of the false. But being a Jedi did have some cons. Three deaths as a Jedi, and your character was deleted. Yes, permadeath, where death equals delete. But three deaths. You didn't lose your FS slot, but the character in the slot was deleted. But that wasn't enough. Many people felt betrayed by SOE's handling of Jedi, and just one month after Holocrons dropped, Galaxies started losing subs for the first time since launch. It was also during this time, though, that mounts and player cities were added to the game. Vehicles could be crafted by master artisans, and with the help of a creature handler, one could turn their pets into a mount. Bioengineers could even craft mountable creatures. With player cities came the politician profession, who could take groups of houses and establish a city that would appear on planet maps for everyone, and even have its own shuttle port that connected to main cities. When the new year rolled around, a bunch of dead Padawans kept complaining about permadeath. You're not all powerful. <laughs> well, I should be. So SOE changed it, so Jedi's just lost XP on death. <laughs> The Jedi problem became even more of an issue, so bounty hunters were given a buff. They could hunt Jedi. With Publish 7, any time a Jedi showed a robe or a lightsaber in public, they would get marked in the bounty hunter mission terminals. They'd send their seeker droids off to different planets, track players down in real time, making for some immersive PvP hunts. And it kept Jedi humble, reminding them they were supposed to be in hiding. This would have been way funnier with permadeath, but bounty hunters never got that glory. 2004 would continue in the Jedi meta, and some new content sprung up called Theme Parks, which were some of the first areas with extensive quest lines attached to them. By October, Jump to Lightspeed finally released, adding space-based content to the game. It took a bit longer than expected, instead of the 6 months as promised, it took 16 months. But hey, starships! You could even decorate your starships as if they were player housing. Hell, players even paid each other to interior decorate for them. There were also new playable races with Solistan and Ithorian, and three new piloting professions. The summer of 2004 would finally see a revamp of how you unlocked Jedi. No more Force-sensitive slot, your actual character would become a Jedi. Instead of straight profession grinding, there was a new checklist of badges to obtain. We ain't got no badges. 
We don't need no badges. I don't have to show you any stinking badges. They were basically achievements. You would have to visit multiple points of interest in the galaxy, <laughs> complete theme park quest lines, and master at least one profession. While questing for badges, you could check your progress with slash check for status and receive a system message with one of six results. Once you reached the final inner glow status, you would eventually receive a visit from the old man, who gives you a force crystal, which unlocks a quest journal, which is the beginning of an extremely long, convoluted, time-gated process of visiting a Jedi village on Dathomir. The village of Aurelia is normally protected by a fog wall until you are attuned with the force. The quest line involves protecting the Jedi village from Sith shadows, and they took three months minimum before you could start the Padawan Trials. And when you finally got to the Padawan Trials, there were 16 more quests, with you traveling all over the galaxy doing different tasks involving multiple professions in the game. Whether this new path to unlocking Jedi was preferable to the holocron grind from before was debatable. But any new Jedi had to go through all of these steps. And then November of 2004, World of Warcraft is released, and subscribers shoot up far past what Star Wars Galaxies had worked up to. There was a lot of WoW envy going around during this time, and not just with Galaxies. The game was buttery smooth by comparison to the jank of Star Wars, and offered a more accessible gameplay loop. But all of Galaxies was made between September of 2000 and June of 2003, one year and ten months. Meanwhile, World of Warcraft had around five years of development time and came from one of the most accomplished game studios of all time in Blizzard Entertainment. In spring 2005, a new expansion was announced, Rage of the Wookiees. It would eventually line up with the release of Revenge of the Sith, but a month before the release of that expansion, SOE announced a patch that would change combat significantly, simply dubbed the Combat Upgrade. It was the biggest modification of the game to date. They would introduce combat levels from 1 to 80. Combat professions were still around, there was just a new number attached to it. Mobs lower than you were easier and gave less XP, and mobs higher than you hit harder and you dealt less damage to them. The combat queue was removed entirely, replaced by individual cooldowns. Armor was completely reworked. Players would need armor certifications to even wear their armor, whereas before, like an actual RPG, you could just throw on whatever equipment you wanted, penalties be damned. The whole upgrade put a lot of players off. In retrospect, many combat upgrade changes make sense to us now. It's what's in almost every single MMO presented to us. But that's exactly why many players rebelled against it. People wanted the current system to be fixed, not to be replaced. Sure, it was full of exploits and balance issues, but it was the pace people liked. SOE even had a combat revamp in the works at the time, being tested by select members of the community. But after WoW launched, LucasArts passed the order to SOE to make the game appeal to a broader audience. And in response, they scrapped everything and rushed in the combat upgrade. Overnight, many items became worse, and some items became better. And over time, a lot of players preferred the combat upgrade system. But the reputation of SOE was heavily damaged in the players' minds. Little did they know how bad it would get in the same year. In May 2005, Rage of the Wookiees is released, adding the Wookiee planet of Kashyyyk. But unlike previous planets, this one was divided into a central area with several instanced dungeons, a first for SWG. Other content would feature cybernetic limbs for player characters, new creature mounts, and starships. Rage of the Wookiees brought a small resurgence, receiving some praise for added content, but the game was still critically panned by media outlets and players for the combat upgrades, which ultimately led to a dip in subs. Regardless of all that, they still sold 1 million box copies by August 2005. Things were going okay. Hell, another expansion was announced. Trials of Obi-Wan would drop in late 2005, including the new planet of Mustafar. It would drop on the same day as the DVD release of Revenge of the Sith. Trials of Obi-Wan would include 50 new quests. HK-47 makes an appearance, because KOTOR. And of course, the ghost of Obi-Wan shows up asking for your help to correct an imbalance in the foals. Just a couple days after this expansion dropped, SOE announced a change that would occur in two weeks. They felt the early game wasn't very newcomer friendly, 
so they decided to revamp not just the combat system this time, but the entire profession system. These changes were called the New Game Enhancements, and it condensed the dozens of professions that you could mix and match into nine classes, based on characters from the films. And it included Jedi. Yeah, now anyone could roll a Jedi at level one, balanced with everything else, as all things should be. Not special, not powerful, not fitting the lore. Any novelty that was left in this class was officially gone. The new characters were Bounty Hunter, based on Boba Fett, Commando, based on Commander Cody, Jedi, based on Luke, Medic, based on 2-1-B, Smuggler, based on Han Solo, Officer, based on Princess Leia, Spy, based on Princess Leia, Entertainer, based on Ula, and Traitor, based on Lando. Which is a good play on words. Regardless of how many professions or skills you had at the time, you had to respec in one of these nine new classes. But perfection mixing, arguably the most identifying aspect of SWG at the time, was now gone. Crafting could now only be done by the trader class. Players now had to manually position their crosshair over their target to inflict maximum damage. And the combat essentially played like a janky WoW clone. And a lot of people cited it was clearly not tested thoroughly because it was very unbalanced. Player housing stuck around and there was some new endgame content for 8 player heroic missions, but overall, players felt deceived that the rug was pulled out from under them, and the game felt severely dumbed down. The Japanese servers shut down due to poor reception, servers became ghost towns, Overnight, the game became a shadow of its old combat upgrade shadow of its even older self. When players and media outlets criticized the NGE, the president of SOE responded, There has never been a release by SOE that has been incomplete. I guess he didn't remember the game's launch at the time. Now, it's true that there were new players who came to play New Game Enhancement Galaxies, but the sub-cancellations were rising dramatically. SOE even offered refunds for Trials of Obi-Wan, over the next few years, there was a steady flow of updates and events in the game, but it never fully recovered. A Death Troopers event took place in celebration of a new horror novel. We did a fun video covering the entire story of that book, link in the description. But LucasArts eventually announced that SWG would be shut down for good. And on December 15th, 2011, the servers for Star Wars Galaxies went offline in a wacky night of devs letting players change their player models, size, and fly around on planets. The game was live for 8 years, 5 months, and 20 days. In conclusion, despite its many issues over the years, many players have fond memories of SWG in all its phases. It had its flaws as all things do, the game was overambitious in design, the code was unfinished at launch, the content tools were non-existent for a while, and it eventually became a textbook example of how not to operate a live service game. SOE's WoW Envy caused them to turn to the dark side. They stopped listening to their fans and changed the game to what they thought the general gaming crowd would want, instead of realizing the best possible version of what they had. And then, when fairly criticized by their own players, double down against them. So here's the Star Wars Galaxies, a dead game that had its moments and is now kept on life support by fans to this day on private servers. Fans wouldn't have to wait long for the next big Star Wars MMO. I'm of course talking about... A brand new online adventure set in the Clone Wars universe! Separatist armies are mobilizing against the Republic, and we need your help to stop them. Obi-Wan will help you learn to wield your lightsaber, Commander Cody will teach you battle strategies, and I will show you how to pilot your ship. This is where the fun begins. But your training doesn't end there. R2, we have new recruits. R2, R2. Yeah, apparently this is a thing. I didn't even realize it until I was doing research for this video. In the late 2000s, the Clone Wars animated show on Cartoon Network started popping off, receiving high praise from many Star Wars fans and bringing a new wave of young fans and products into the franchise. Just before the release of the third season, out of seemingly nowhere, a new Star Wars MMO was announced at E3 2010, Clone Wars Adventures, and you'll never believe who made this one. 
LucasArts rung up SOE once again, looking to make yet another online game, but this time it would be a browser-based MMO. It launched in September 2010, rated E for everyone. It was made in SOE's own proprietary engine, Forge Light, which they used for other online games such as Free Realms, Planetside 2, and EverQuest Next, which was eventually cancelled. The game matched the aesthetic of the show perfectly. Well, how is that fair? There's a whole section of the lounge that Padawans aren't allowed into? And featured a wide variety of minigames that fit within the canon and extended some storylines. There was even instanced player housing and guilds. People could use their credits to buy little cosmetics, or the real money currency, station cash, to buy companions, add-ons for companions, boomboxes to make people dance, furnishings, cosmetics, and much more. The mace window, really? Events were hosted on occasion by SOE employees that usually consisted of random minigames, trivia, duels, and other rewards. The game's reviews were meddling, and the game was criticized for locking away a lot of content behind paywalls, constantly pushing people to buy their station cash, or subscribe to the game. I think back then, the free-to-play model was still a little looked down upon. And while its sheer number of minigames was an attraction for a lot of young people, it seemed like more of a quantity over quality situation. For many players, it was simply a place to run around and have fun in the Clone Wars universe with a low point of entry. Two years into the game, battle classes and combat zones were added, with additional content and rewards. There were four classes, Jedi, Sith, Trooper, and Mercenary, with Trooper being the only class available for free, and Jedi was available with the standard membership. The other two classes cost 750 station cash, which I can only imagine was 750 USD, or about $10.50 nowadays. The game lasted a surprising length of time. The servers were shut down on March 31st, 2014, and the game was live for 3 years, 6 months, and 16 days. So cheers to Clone Wars Adventures. I didn't even know you existed. Finally, we're caught up to the present. Back in 2003, Bioware released its most popular game to date, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. This is a single-player RPG that's regarded by many as not only the greatest Star Wars game, but also one of the all-time best RPGs. Once again, this is a game that has heavy roots in Dungeons & Dragons. It uses a D20 system for its combat, and it's based on the Star Wars role-playing game, which is a tabletop RPG based on D&D 3rd Edition both of which I played way too much of back in the day. KOTOR had an amazing storyline taking place in the era of the Old Republic, 4,000 years prior to the events of the films. This era gave Bioware creative license to use all kinds of Jedi and Sith material and make their own unique storyline free of the Skywalker saga. It featured cinematic cutscenes, deep character customization, and a colorful cast of party members. There was also a lot of player choice, alignment changes based on your actions, and optional side quests. It was a revolutionary RPG at the time, especially for console players, softly introducing many gamers to D&D mechanics. The reception was overwhelmingly positive. In 2005, World of Warcraft was blowing up in the gaming scene, and other developers wanted a piece of the proverbial Gore-Tusk liver pie. When Bioware started tossing around ideas for their own MMO, they considered their previous games based on the D&D world, like Baldur's Gate and Neverwinter Nights, but they were riding their high off of KOTOR. And they didn't make KOTOR 2, that was Obsidian, but 2 was out at the time, adding to the hype potential of an MMO set during the Old Republic era, where Jedi and Sith were readily available battling on a regular basis. After talks with LucasArts, they agreed to a partnership to make the next Star Wars Online game. At the time, SWG was going through its combat upgrade new game enhancement year, and LucasArts already had the foresight to start a new MMO with Bioware. One that was rich with Jedi, Sith, unexplored territory, and a blank page for telling new stories. November 2005, a new project was born, Star Wars The Old Republic. But before we get to all the lightsabers and sexy side quests, some history of video game financial decisions. Because, yay, Star Wars games. As pre-development began for the game, 
BioWare merged with another majorly successful North American developer in Pandemic Studios, most known for the original Battlefront games. And the amount of layoffs this merger caused? Oh, yeah, there were no layoffs. In fact, all 400 employees received shares in the newly formed company, BioWare Pandemic, or more formerly known as VG Holding Corp. It was invested in by a private equity firm, Elevation Partners, and this is all gonna matter at some point. It wouldn't be until March 2006 that development on the older public began. Bioware set up a brand new development studio in Austin, Texas. Yes, the same city as Sony Online Entertainment. Galaxies and the Old Republic were both being worked on within a 10 minute drive of each other. Bioware even brought in industry veterans who had previously worked on Galaxies. And this studio was solely dedicated to the Old Republic. They would eventually get a license with Hero Engine, a brand new platform specifically for the development of MMOs. This engine wouldn't have its first stable release for another five years, but Bioware liked it enough to build their entire game in it. And things were humming along until October, when Elevation Partners sold VG Holding Corp, Bioware Pandemic, to Electronic Arts for $775 million, equivalent to almost $1.4 billion today. That's a lot of credits. From that point on, Bioware and Pandemic became entities of EA, one of the most hated companies at the time. EA had been infamous for many years for acquiring successful game studios, restricting their creative freedom in the name of risk aversion and profit, and then shutting down any studio the moment they started performing poorly. ...to a recent poll in which EA was chosen as a semi-finalist for, quote, worst company in America an honor it also received last year. In October 2008, Bioware, EA, and LucasArts announced the development of a new MMORPG, Star Wars The Old Republic. You assumed no force could challenge you. And now... Finally. We have returned. This is the first time it hit the public's ears, and it was a massive game. It was never officially announced how much the game cost to make, but nowadays people speculate it cost around 200 million or more, making it the second most expensive video game ever made behind Grand Theft Auto V. At some point, they had around 1,000 employees, all working under the watchful eye of EA, expected to deliver hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. They announced what separated this MMO from others at the time would be their story. They had 12 writers working full-time for two years straight to craft storylines for each class, worthy of the Bioware logo. The company said that this online game would have more story content than all of their other games combined. Now, the bad and the ugly. EA has confirmed 1,500 layoffs as part of a company-wide restructuring plan. As a result of this, over a dozen still unannounced games will be cancelled as EA refocuses on their big-selling franchises. EA lays off 1,500 workers, including the dissolution of Pandemic Studios. Welcome to Star Wars The Old Republic here at Comic-Con. I've never seen fans this passionate about a game ever. I'm standing in line for my 20th round in PvP. I was doing the Black Talon Flashpoint. I mean, I'm really new to playing video games, but it was still really easy to just jump in. Every character in the game talks to you and tells you part of the quest line. It's just amazing. This project is massive. There are so many lines. My script probably is this big. There are hundreds of thousands of lines of dialogue. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of Star Wars and I really felt just immersed in the Star Wars, which is awesome. There's a spy over Be here! Like a spy! By fall 2011, the beta test for SWOTOR went live and players got an early taste of the next big thing. And that's when people realized, bluntly, it was World of Warcraft with Bioware cutscenes. Now, I don't mean to make this comparison a lot in this video, but the director of SWOTOR himself stated much later on that he wished he made it more KOTOR Online instead of Star Wars WoW. 
but that's kind of what happens when the creative process is streamlined to maximize profit and minimize risk. The Old Republic is released on Tuesday, December 20th, 2011 for 55 US dollars plus a $5 fee if you pre-order. Lamau. Fan response is amazing. We've spent years working on this game and we wanted to make the greatest Star Wars game for our fans. For the first time ever, I care about my character. I actually care about this bounty hunter I've made from level one all the way up to level 50. And like, even the, the companion characters too, like they actually have little storylines too. And it's like, like Mako, like I want to make Mako happy. How can I argue with that? <laughs> like some kind of romantic genius. This is playing Star Wars with like the best toys that our technology can offer. It's getting to play Star Wars with your friends and your friends can be scattered all around the world, you know, or all around the country. And what could be more awesome than that? The Old Republic features eight primary classes, split evenly between lightsaber-wielding force users and blaster-wielding tech users. Players can choose between the Galactic Republic and the Sith Empire, of which their classes are functionally the same, so really there are four classes. Their storylines, however, are very much unique. Eight full storylines are featured, complete with cinematic cutscenes, player choices, companions, and romance options. Each class has two advanced classes to select from, which each have their own playstyle, skill trees, and specializations. Tank, healer, melee, and range DPS. Combat is very similar to WoW. You unlock skills, plop them on your cast bar, and away you go. While doing class storylines, players also run different dungeons, aka flashpoints, as they level up and get some extra gear. At the end game, you can do raids, aka operations, of which there were three shortly after the launch of Vanilla SWOTOR. There's also open world PvP if you opt into it, as well as instanced PvP battles called War Zones. These are 8 vs 8 objective based battles, similar to Battlegrounds in WoW. Game modes include battling over control points and hut ball. Hutball obstacles are provided by Circa Corporation. Circa, brilliant solutions for a brighter tomorrow. There's both gathering and crafting, letting players create items that range from weapons and armor to enhancements, consumables, and more. You get around from planet to planet at the starports, there are flight points, and even mounts. It also wouldn't be the Old Republic without companions that come from your storylines and assist you on the battlefield. You can also give gifts to companions to increase your influence with them, giving them additional bonuses. And although the game did generally play like World of Warcraft, the storyline is the star of the show in this game, and that's a great reason to play it to this day. Here yeah, kid, take the shot control color. I'll set it to a higher level. I'm officially on strike when it comes to domestic duties. <sighs> wow, nice work. Ow, Bantha poo. I already prepared Jace's quarters. I'll go ahead and show her to them. That's a handy toy. Ow! Garbage! Just please remove this collar. Don't you understand? I'm gonna die from this. Like, I, I can't feel anything anymore that's not this collar. <laughs> On to our next exercise in domination and destruction. Use it enough, she'll show you the back door to her mother's house. Huh? And the Jedi problem Star Wars Galaxies had to deal with? Well, the Old Republic gets away with having Jedi and Sith around, so technically it was solved. The only sacrifice is that they aren't that special. They're just another class to pick, balanced alongside your smugglers and snipers. The game still became the world's fastest growing subscription MMO in history, gaining more than 1 million players in the first three days of its launch. It received high praise for its innovative addition of voiced cutscenes and cinematic storytelling, the game got rave reviews, and it seemed like everything people wanted in their Star Wars MMO. But people still criticized it, that the combat and animations felt primitive out the gate, and that it brought little new to the table in terms of gameplay and some cited a lackluster endgame. But it didn't matter. By March 2012, EA confirmed that The Old Republic had reached 1.7 million subscribers. Just two months after that, they announced it dropped to 1.3 million. And a couple months after that, they confirmed it was below 1 million, but above 500,000. And through late 2012, they would fall under the half million mark. 
And new at noon, KXAN has learned a local gaming company is undergoing a round of layoffs. An electronic arts spokesperson confirms BioWare is restructuring its studio. The spokesperson says some employees will be moved to other projects within EA, but others will leave the company. There are about 400 people working for the company. EA says the layoffs are tough, but it will help the staff focus on maintaining and growing the game. It seemed like many players subscribed at launch because shiny new Star Wars MMO, but once they reached the end game and there wasn't a continuation of their story, they would leave. This concerned EA because number went down. Bioware announced that they would go free to play, and they said this change was not a reaction to the dip in subscribers. Rather, it was more because free to play had become a market standard for MMOs, which I think is half true. The Switch was clearly a reaction to the dropping subscriber count, or else they wouldn't have changed it. But free-to-play was a growing trend due to an increasingly oversaturated market. But before the game actually went free-to-play, something big happened. Disney acquired Lucasfilm for $4 billion, and through Lucasfilm also owns LucasArts. This meant a lot of things, obviously, but the development of The Old Republic would remain mostly untouched by the mouse and left to EA and Bioware to manage. It was announced a bit later that Disney was retconning a large majority of the Expanded Universe lore in an effort to make their Star Wars canon more cohesive and consistent across new media. The Old Republic was built on the lore of KOTOR, which was dubbed non-canon or in Disney's new lingo, Legends. So to this day, the Old Republic finds itself in the exceptionally rare position of being allowed to write new Legends material. I think this effectively makes this a multiverse, and I'm ready for the multiverse movie. It's still never been officially stated why Disney let The Old Republic continue their non-canon story, but just a couple of guesses. For one, it doesn't cost Disney a dime to continue letting Bioware bring in large amounts of revenue by providing a continued story. And two, there may have been contracts signed by LucasArts prior to the acquisition that have to be honored to Bioware. Whatever the reason, the Old Republic would continue, and Disney would eventually make their own, less old Republic. The game went free to play in November of that year. Players could now access all base story content for free, but would have to pay a premium subscription for additional high-level content and unlimited access to PvP war zones. Paid subs would also get a monthly allotment of the new Cartel Coins. This became Bioware Austin's new way of keeping the lights on. Cartel coins could be earned in small ways for free, but they're mainly purchased with real money. They can be exchanged for pets, mounts, cosmetics, and other services. Items bought off the cartel market can also be traded freely after 36 hours. With the change to free-to-play, more players flocked in, and the community thrived and the game made more money on its cartel shop model than its subscription model. This brings us to 2013, a year with many changes and new features. It saw the advent of the appearance designer, die modules, and character editors. It's also the year that expansions started rolling out, which would all be digital. Gone are the days of physical copies. The first expansion for the Old Republic came out, The Rise of the Hut Cartel, which featured new story, an increased level cap to 55, a new planet, and a new raid. The Hutt Cartel violated Republic space and seized the planet Makem. They've blockaded the system with 30 Ajur class heavy cruisers. The Huts will not be allowed to expand their dominion at our expense. <laughs> the expansion was well received and is one of the more liked expansions to this day. A month later, EA stated that the Old Republic's average monthly revenue doubled since going free to play gaining more than 1.7 million player logins and subscriptions stabilized at just under 500,000. They vowed to continually invest in new content every six weeks or so. Later that year, Disney signed a 10-year exclusivity deal with EA to publish all future Star Wars games. The Old Republic was already an EA product, so it didn't change much. February 2014, the Galactic Starfighter expansion is released as a minor expansion adding space-based combat zones, customizable starships, and 12 vs 12 PvP space battles. Welcome to Kuwak Drive Yards, the beating heart of the Republic Navy, a heart we're about to fix. We must do everything to ensure Kuwak Drive Yards remains in Republic control. Just one month after that, another minor expansion is released in Galactic Strongholds, 
which introduced player housing and guild halls, which are instanced, yes, it's not open world like the sandbox chaos of galaxies, but they're beautiful and vast estates, and they came with hundreds of decorations that could be placed using a hook system. Guilds could also share a flagship, a place to meet up, decorate, and wage war over planetary control with other guilds for unique rewards. It even gives buffs to players who are on the planet the flagship is parked at. Later that year, the fourth expansion comes out, Shadows of Revan. Revan has forged an army with a single purpose. To change the galaxy forever. Empire. Republic. We must unite or fall. The level cap was raised once again to level 60, with new flashpoints, operations, two new planets, and a new revamp to the skill tree system. I think it's safe to say, based on numerous opinions on the internet, that this is the most beloved expansion the game would ever see. Players love the story, its characters, and its action-packed climax. Not only that, it's centered around Revan, a central character from Knights of the Old Republic and one of the all-time fan favorites in the expanded universe. The skill tree changes were well received by the community, but some pointed out that the previous skill trees were identical to WoW's old skill trees, and were changed to a new system that reflected WoW's revamped system. Oh, and at some point ability training costs are removed, so class trainers become pretty much pointless. Come spring of the next year, the outfit designer is added to the game, making it a lot easier to customize your appearance on the fly. This is similar to WoW's transmogrification or Final Fantasy XIV's glamour plates. In fall of 2015, the next major expansion dropped, Knights of the Fallen Empire, new level cap 65. Players were given one free character boost, bringing them up to the previous expansion's level cap, which was a feature just recently added in Warlords of Draenor at that point. And there was a new storyline, one where two player factions fall and they must unite to defeat the Iron Horde. I mean Eternal Empire. A new level sync system was introduced, forcing character levels down to the zone's appropriate level, and you would be able to get XP from quests in that area no matter how high you were. Apparently one of the main reasons this level sync was added is because people were soloing world bosses. There was a bit of criticism with this change, that other MMOs would let you voluntarily sink down instead of being forced to. Regardless, some stats didn't even scale down properly, or lower level gear would be more optimal than your high level gear when scaled, and for some of these issues, a fix wouldn't come for another 7 years. It seems like reception for Knights of the Fallen Empire is mixed to negative. Despite the usual amazing cinematics and extra content, People say the expansion played more like a standalone game than an actual expansion. A few months later, January 2016, EA reports that The Old Republic is at its highest subscriber level in three years. This means that they were likely at half a million subs once again. It's an MMO that was not losing steam despite the criticism. All of 2016 goes by and in the holiday, the next expansion drops. Knights of the Eternal Throne, which is a continuation of Knights of the Fallen Empire. New level cap is raised to 70, players get another free level boost, and 9 chapters of story are added. A lower amount than usual, and a lot of players cited it felt rushed. This expansion overall seems to have the same or slightly worse reception than Fallen Empire, unfortunately. November 2017, in update 5.5, over 20 servers are merged down to just 5. This was alarming to some, but overall a lot of players embraced this change. Bioware would also allow players to have more characters per account, and additional slots can even be purchased on the cartel market up to 100. That's too many characters. But go off. By June, Baldur's Gate designer and 22-year Bioware veteran, Senior Creative Director James Olin, retires to start a book publishing company. This is around the time where he does interviews and comments how he kind of wishes The Old Republic was more KOTOR Online instead of WoW Star Wars. But I digress. At this point, The Old Republic has been a success for many years. It's around this point that an open secret starts circulating that Bioware's The Old Republic staff are being plucked to go crunch on Anthem, a new game that was being hyped up at the time. And by January 2019, Anthem is released. 56% of people liked this game. 
around this time, Rise of the Hutt Cartel and Shadows of Revan, two of the most liked expansions, were made available for free-to-play accounts, giving even more content to try out before ever dropping a dime. By October of that year, the Onslaught expansion is dropped, bringing yet more story. The Meridian Complex, a state-of-the-art Republic shipyard. It nears completion on the planet Corellia. We will win a victory for the Empire. It will change the course of the galaxy forever. They added same-gender romance options for the first time, two new planets, a flashpoint, an operation, and the new Nautilin playable species. Many believe that Onslaught was a fresh retake on the Republic vs. Imperial storyline that many players enjoyed, and it seems to be considered one of the game's better expansions. By July of 2020, The Old Republic is added to Steam, bringing in a massive surge of new users and offering a smoother patching and launching experience. This also meant that player activity could be tracked through Steam charts. Although these numbers aren't exact because not everyone launches through Steam, it does have the benefit of tracking trends of the player base. An effort to reboot Anthem called Anthem Next is cancelled by Bioware, and mentions spending more effort towards Dragon Age, Mass Effect, and updating the Old Republic. I guess that game sucked. But hey, more of the Old Republic stuff. So what do they do with this newfound energy? Galactic Seasons. It's basically Battle Pass. It, it operates like Battle Pass. It's not really new content, but it's something to do, you know? But in February 2022, the next expansion is dropped. Legacy of the Sith. The Jedi will tell you that to seek power is to embrace darkness. The Empire will tell you that power is a reward for deception. The weak will still have power. But power belongs to those who are unafraid to take it. This fire will light the way for the strong. Power will be yours. If you are willing to power. The new combat style system basically meant that instead of the two styles you got per origin story, you'd actually get the other two styles from the similar force or tech classes. But also, if you had unlocked them, you could take the light side versions or dark side versions of each. Meaning you could be more of a light side Sith, a dark side Jedi. Same deal with the tech classes, you could be a bounty hunter that plays like a commando. Subscribers are also able to add a second combat style to their character. Legacy of the Sith came with a moderate amount of content and features, including the new planet of Manan, the water world from KOTOR, but this expansion was not well received at all. After years of waiting and getting only allegedly a few hours of content, people were disappointed, also citing a middling storyline that they didn't care for. The sentiment I read a lot was that people just wanted some plot lines to wrap up already, like with Darth Malgus, a villain who's been around since the game's release. This would unfortunately be the last expansion to date during the making of this video, and in spring 2023, Bioware announces that they are preparing to move the Old Republic to cloud-based servers on Amazon Web Services. They also implemented an update that would finally update the game from 32-bit to 64-bit. SWOTOR 64 will allow the use of more than 4 gig of RAM, improving performance and reducing lag for many systems. It also meant future content for the game could use more complex environments and scenes. They also announced they were working on an Asia-Pacific server. A month later, Bioware announced that they were handing over the keys of the game to Broadsword Online Games. They said they wanted to shift their focus to other games like the next Mass Effect and Dragon Age. So Bioware left, marking the end of a saga for the Old Republic, and leaving players with many questions on the future of the game. At its peak, it had 500 people working on the game and is now managed by a team of 14 gamers. Broadsword was formed in 2014, after EA shut down Mythic Entertainment, the studio behind Dark Age of Camelot and Warhammer Online. Afterwards, Mythic's co-founder made Broadsword, and EA gave them Dark Age of Camelot and Ultima Online. And now, they would manage the Old Republic. Some people joked around saying this was a retirement home for MMOs, but I think SWOTOR is a bit of an exception, since it still has predicted around 100,000 players, that's not an insignificant amount. 
By August, the servers finished moving to the cloud. Some players experienced some issues here or there, but overall, the player base noticed a smooth transition or just didn't even notice at all. In November, the Asian Pacific server opens up Shea Vizsla with barely 24 hours notice and little publicity. Many players were happy to finally have a server in this region, but many also wished they had a little bit more heads up so they could plan special events like their hardcore playthroughs, inspired by WoW Classic Hardcore. We're getting close to present day here with December 2023. Chains in the Dark, the most recent update, and the first big one by Broadsword, added a small amount of story, but more noticeably, the Galactic Trade Network, basically the auction house, received a complete revamp with an advanced search feature and more streamlined flow for claiming and selling items. They also introduced new cinematic lighting for cutscenes, reflecting more accurate shadows and details for characters. In conclusion, the Old Republic has been alive for an impressive 12 years and 2 months at this point. From their press streams, Broadsword does seem to have the best intentions moving forward, but it's yet to be seen if we'll see some miracle resurrection of this game, or if Broadsword is just there to tend to its retirement as another aging MMO. But what do longtime players think? When asked what their favorite part of the game is, many of them mention the intertwining storylines, the adult tones, player choices, and they love having a plethora of their own characters in the Old Republic era. Many love the setting, the vistas, the beautiful planets. The game has an amazing original soundtrack that invokes the feeling of Star Wars. A lot of people love to decorate their characters, cheekily calling it Space Barbie, and of course they love playing with each other. Isn't that nice? There's still many communities dedicated to end game content out there, and players keep the game afloat with the microtransactions. Overall, the game feels like a very decent single player story that's baked into an aging WoW clone, and a vocal group of players feel the game is more stagnant than ever. It kind of seems carried by its IP and its glory days. But it is free to play, so you can check it out anytime. I've heard many recommendations on which storylines are best. If you're going Imperial, then go with the Operative story. If you're going Republic, Jedi Knight is apparently a must-see, or play whatever class fantasy you want, I don't care. A lot of veterans of the game also say that the core game story is better than any of the expansions, so you're gonna get some of the best content just trying it out. So cheers to the Old Republic, still kicking, refusing to go quietly into that dark night, or space, or night, dark night of the Old Republic, something, something. I almost forgot there was a future part of this video. In the case that SWOTOR does go into that dark space, which I don't think will happen for a handful of years, what's next? I don't know, I'm not an industry insider, but my first speculation would be... nothing. Disney doesn't seem to want to push for MMOs, where the market is saturated and the risk is high. A Marvel MMO was in the works until it was cancelled in 2022. It was being developed by Daybreak Game Company, formerly Sony Online Entertainment. Making an MMO is no small feat, it costs a lot, and it's extremely difficult to build and maintain. Not to mention, current interest or disinterest in the franchise is at a much different point now than it was a couple decades ago. Maybe they'll change at some point, I don't know. The Old Republic seems like it just fills that niche of a live Star Wars MMO, and probably will for many more years. But if they actually make another MMO, I'm guessing it would be set during the era of the High Republic which is like the Old Republic 2 and would be the most uninteresting idea possible. When it comes down to it, I don't think the Jedi problem will ever be solved. My hot take is that lightsabers ruin everything. In a role-playing game, immersion is important, even if you don't role-play. Nothing will ever beat the feeling of getting that slightly better sword or shield or armor or staff. You'll always know there's something better than what you got. You can't just give a level 5 tune the strongest weapon in all of science fiction. It just feels lazy and boring. It's pretty bad in the Old Republic when you get your first lightsaber. My recommended weapon is still not my lightsaber. It's a training staff. How does that work? Unfortunately, no one can fathom not being able to swing a lightsaber in a Star Wars MMO, so this will never change. And that will always be what holds back true greatness. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. This was kind of a longer one that I didn't expect to be so long. 
but I'm able to make these videos thanks to you all. I also try to keep sponsors out, so subscribe and ring the bell to keep an eye out for more videos. And share this with a friend if you really enjoyed it. It really helps out. Special shout out to the Master Tier supporters on Patreon, Aquarial, Haliomorpha, Jordan Rowe, The Avion 12, and Uninvited Haggis. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Peace.